church. Am I on, Kyle? I am on. It's good to be together. Excited to have our friends from Paseo Baptist Church in Kansas City joining us for worship today. God is good all the time. All the time. And so I want to introduce my friend, Leron Thompson, Pastor Leron Thompson, the pastor of Paseo Baptist, to bring you a greeting this morning. We bid you greetings from Kansas City. And we're so glad to be here with you today to lift up the name of Jesus. And we're here uh, because we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to worship together. Amen. We can do it right here on God's created earth. And so let's relax, lift up our hands, lift up our voices to worship the Lord together today. And we are so excited about what God is doing to, in this place today. So I want to invite you to stand as you're able. So we begin our worship here at Trinity with something we call the worship. And it's our first opportunity, and I use the word opportunity because gathering together in worship is an opportunity that we get to share in. It's a privilege to share in. And so we're going to do a responsive reading. You're going to see the words up on the screen. And when you see the part that says people, that's your turn to join in. And I want to note that in the statements, there are exclamation points. And I'm not an English major, but I do know when you have an exclamation point, that means you bring a little extra energy. So this is your opportunity to set the tone for worship of bringing glory to our God. So let's begin in our call to worship. So from every nation and every language and every ethnicity, we cry out. Salvation, Salvation belongs, belongs to our God, God and to the Lamb. Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving. Honor and power be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Let's prepare our hearts for worship today. How many of you know we serve a great God? I said we serve a great God. So let's lift our hands and just sing this song together. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. Come on, lift your voice and say how great, how great is our God. Sing with me. Is our God. And all will see, yeah, how great. Is our God. Come on, one more time. Let's lift it up together. Oh, how great, how great is our God. Come on, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see it. How great is our God. Can we just sing the first verse together? The first verse just says, The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself. Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great, how great, come on, clap right here, is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see him, how great. Is our God. Let's take it out. You're the name above all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of our praise. And my heart will 
much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow? How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you if he dresses the leaves? Cause Jaira, you are enough. Let me hear you say Jaira, Jaira, you are enough. Come on, lift your voice and say Jaira, Jaira, you are enough. One more time, say Jaira, you are enough. I'm already loved, I'm already chosen, I know who I am, I know what you've spoken, I'm already loved, more than I could imagine, and that is enough. Cause you are enough And that is enough Cause you are enough Shall we pray? Father, we thank you Thank you for this day that you have made And we will rejoice and be glad in it God, we've gathered here not out of tradition We've gathered not because we look good but we've gathered to give your name the glory. We've gathered to give your name the praise because we recognize that if it had not been for you on our side, we don't know where we would be. So God, thank you for rocking us in the cradle of your arm. Thank you for touching us with your loving kindness and your healing hand. Thank you, God, for being more than enough. Thank you for being El Shaddai. Thank you for being Elohim. Thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And we will be careful to give your name all the glory and honor and praise. For you said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So, Lord, we lift the name that is above every name, the name that demons tremble, the name at which every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that you are Lord. The strong name of Jesus the Christ. We pray and we say together, amen. Amen. You know, I looked out on Friday night during the ice cream social. I'm looking out right now and I say, I think this is a little bit what heaven looks like. See every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered around the throne, lifting up high the name of Jesus. And that's why we are together today. This is normally the time where we share our life together, the announcements. Um, a lot of our announcements about what's happened in the life of Trinity are in the bulletin. You can grab one out in the foyer if you didn't, in the narthex if you didn't grab one on the way in. But I wanted to let all of you know today that we have lunch after service in the Peterson Hall, our fellowship hall just down the hallway. And you all are invited. You're all invited to join us for lunch. There is no charge. Just come and be blessed and meet somebody new. So right after our worship today, I want to encourage you to uh, make your way down, hang out, have lunch, because God is doing something special in the life of Trinity and something special in the life of Paseo. We bring these two congregations together as one body because we are all part of the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. Amen. So we're going to get an opportunity, I use the word opportunity again, another opportunity to meet somebody. Um, our tradition here is to pass the peace during this time. 
And so I want to encourage you to stand up and find somebody, greet them with the, with the peace of Christ and welcome them into worship this morning. So let's take some time and greet each other this morning. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. I just want to praise you forever, forever. Blessings and glory and honor and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Amen. I invite you back to your seats again. I invite you back to your seats again. Beautiful. I invite you back to your seats as we continue to worship this morning. So we don't pass the plate anymore at our church. I don't know if you do a paseo. But I do want to make mention this morning that we have something here called the deacon offer. The deacon offering is something that we collect. It's a special offering to bless those in our community, to bless those who are struggling, to bless those in a tangible way in the name of Jesus. So there is no obligation, but we will have a deacon standing by the door on the way out. And so I will leave that to between you and the Holy Spirit. But th during our time, the offertory time, so our, tra our new tradition is that we use this time because we don't pass the plate. We use this time to consider how is God calling you into ministry? And you might say, I'm not, I'm not a pastor. It doesn't matter. Because God has anointed us and called us as a kingdom of priests to represent him in the world. Because Christianity is not a spectator sport. But God calls us to lean into, be a blessing to all the people of the earth. And so... As my brother Nate plays a little bit, might you take this time with a posture of prayer to consider how God might be calling you at this time.
you sing and join me in the doxology. As we sing the doxology, the words will be on the screen. Once again, Father God, this morning we come together united by the power of your Holy Spirit as one church. Though we do not shed our individual stories and our individual identities, God, we bring all of them together a beautiful mosaic of ethnicities and backgrounds and places. We bring them together as a beautiful collage of your kingdom. God, we celebrate that while we might be different, we are the same in you. That brothers and sisters, you unite us. You connect us. You bind us together by your love, Jesus. And so, Lord, we do not forget those amongst us, Lord, who struggle. God, we know in our congregations today, and I have specific people in mind, who are fighting illness and recovery, financial uncertainties. God, we have brothers and sisters who don't know what tomorrow will bring them. Well, we do know, God, that you know our stories. Yeah. You're aware of our situation. Yeah. And you come near to us, Lord, when we feel alone, Lord. You do not leave us alone because you've promised us that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. So we come together. God, we pray for those brothers and sisters who struggle. God, we pray for us that, God, you give us the wherewithal, the sensitivity, the awareness, Lord, to be aware of those among us who struggle, that we might come and lend a hand, that we might come and put our arms around, that we might come and be the church, this family that you have created. God, would you move us and motivate us. And may we not keep that spirit of love and blessing within our family congregation, Lord, but might we be a blessing in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces, God, that people might look at our testimonies and say, there's something different about them. And I want to know what it is. I want that life. I want that hope. I want that joy. So God, might you work through us. We are humble that you would consider us, that you would welcome us, that you would invite us into ministry. God, we know that you could do it with a word, but you invite us to be a part, to, to collaborate and cooperate and partner with us in, in the restoration of all things, God. So may we be courageous to step into those opportunities that you lay at our feet, Lord. Might we say yes to you today. And God, we know that we cannot do this in our own strength. We're well aware of our shortcomings and our weaknesses, Lord. And so we pray the prayer of Jesus that you taught us to pray your Lord's prayer. We start by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
What a beautiful day the Lord has given us after a crazy week of weather. <laughs> so today, the word comes from the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 12. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together with all of these brothers and sisters gathered in the name of Jesus. And again, we do welcome our brothers and sisters from Paseo Baptist Church coming all the way from Kansas City, Missouri to be together with us. So thank you for coming. And what a perfect week for you to join us as we begin a new series called Glory to God, that we examine why we worship. And you might say, well, why are we spending time to talk about why we worship? We just come and worship. And that's just it. So often, Sunday after Sunday, especially if this becomes our routine, is that we can sort of mindlessly just come into worship and not be intentional about it and not really think about why we're here. What are we doing here? So I want to, over the next six weeks, starting with today, remind us of the why. Remind us of some of the characteristics of God and the attributes of God that we celebrate in worship that we might be intentional, and that we might sing like we sung this morning. Such a beautiful chorus that we join together. And that that doesn't stay in this room. We are supposed to be people of worship wherever we go. And that's not just about singing songs, but it's the way that we live our lives, Amen. bringing God glory in all that we say and all that we do. So to begin this series, I want to start back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. And I want to remind us that God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> that when God tells us something, he keeps his promises. And what he said to Abram way back in the book of Genesis is he blessed Abram and Abram's family and said, And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Church, that is our purpose. That we don't exist just because we like these people or this is a fun place to hang out or maybe I get a good cup of coffee or maybe I, we have lunch once in a while or it's fun or it's interesting. No, we gather together as a fellowship to shine a light into the darkness of our world. Amen? Amen. Y'all with me this morning? Yes, sir. Okay. I was hoping for maybe a little more uh, participation, so I, I was told that we'd have a little participation. Amen. So, uh, okay, that's what I, I'm, I'm trying to set my expect. Good. I'm trying to set my expectations accordingly. So, okay. So that's our purpose. We've been talking about it at Trinity. We've been working through the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches that our Lord Jesus gave to the Apostle John. And he calls the church a lampstand, because that's what we are. If you ever sung the song, This Little Light of Mine, that's what we're supposed to do. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. That is our purpose. That's, that's job one. Everything else is bonus. But we are to set an example to represent the Lord in our worlds. But let's acknowledge that in our pursuit of giving God glory, in our pursuit of sharing the love of Jesus, that life happens. 
And it doesn't always work out the way that we plan. It doesn't always happen when things are going just fine. And so when we find our brother John in the book of Revelation, he's in exile. And to be in exile in the Roman Empire means that they want to get you out of there. That you're causing too much good trouble. And so they want to shut you up. They want to close your mouth. They want to get you out of the picture. And so they ship John off to this island called Patmos. And on this island, he must wonder, God, what are you doing? Where are you? See, the church had been in existence for about 60 years at this point. Jesus had been resurrected in 33 AD, and this is probably written in the 90s. And so at the beginning, there's all sorts of excitement, and the Holy Spirit moves, and all these people are drawn into fellowship. But after a while, there becomes resistance. As the church grows and the church expands, people start to get threatened. How many of you know that when God's Spirit moves and starts to challenge the principalities and powers in our world, that people get nervous? When the church is on the move, people start getting nervous. The people who are in power, who are in authority, they start getting nervous because we declare that Jesus alone is the king, not somebody else, not some human being, and that's a threat. So, So John gets put off in exile. And while he's on exile, God hasn't forgotten about him. How many of you want to know today that when you find yourself struggling, when you find yourself hopeless, that God hasn't forgotten about you either? That when we find ourselves in those dark places, that God doesn't forget about us. He's well aware. And so he meets John, and John writes, and if you want to follow along in your Bibles with me, we are in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. There should be Bibles in the pew, or you might have brought a Bible with you this morning. But he he introduces himself as I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom in the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And you can get a little bit of an insight into his frame of mind when he describes himself as a companion in the suffering. That to follow Jesus, there was a price to be paid. There was a cost to be paid. So often we've been sold a bill of goods that if you follow Jesus and everything's going to be great and every day you're going to wake up and skip out of bed and how many of you know that's not true? (laughs) That matter of fact, following Jesus tends to make life more challenging. But it's worth it. it It's worth it. And so he is our brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom which requires patience, endurance. Now, I I said before to our congregation here, I'm not by nature a very patient person. I like to see things happen. Let's go, Jesus. Let's go, Lord. And how many of you know that God's timetable is not always our timetable? Well, well. So we must be patient and have patient endurance. But while John is in exile, while he is patiently enduring, Jesus gives him an amazing vision in chapter 7. And starting in verse 9, he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Imagine how that must have struck John. As he is in exile, as he's wondering what is going to happen to the church. Because at this point, the Roman Empire was starting to actively persecute God's people. People were dying for their faith. And I'm sure in the back of the leaders of the early church, they're wondering, are we going to make it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? And he gets this picture. Yes, John, you're going to be successful. You're going to be so successful that there's going to be a gathering in heaven that it's so big that you can't count everyone, which must have seemed incredible to John in his situation. Really, Lord? I can't even count that much? That We're going to be that successful? 
And then it wouldn't just be limited to the Jewish population because that's how the church started. The church started as the children of Abraham. We talked about Abraham at the beginning. But as things started to develop and things started to grow, and as the Holy Spirit shows up, God reminds the children of Abraham, this is not just for them, it's for everybody. And just to give you a picture of what that actually looks like, that every tribe, people, and language, did you know today, on planet Earth, there is believed to be 17,104 unique people groups. 17,000 unique, I mean 17,000 languages, customs, dialects, ethnicities, we got a little snapshot. This is like a sample size this morning. But, yeah. but this is a big global can- canvas that God is, is working on. If I believe in this word, which I do, by the way, there's going to be at least a representative from every one of those people groups gathered around the throne. That, that this movement of God is going to be successful. And so then God gives us a vision of a united, diverse, triumphant church. I want to break that down. United, that yes, we have differences. Yes, we might not agree with everything. Yes, we probably don't all vote the same way. But we're united in Jesus. That Jesus alone is our king. And we're diverse. If you notice in that verse 9, it didn't say that and God, God eliminated ethnicity, God eliminated language, and he made everybody the same. Right. Nope. That's not the picture. Right. The picture is that each of you is created in the image of God. Each one of you are God's children. Each one of you is invited to the banquet that God is providing for us in heaven. Right. And that we need each one. That if we're missing a language, if we're missing an ethnicity, if we're missing that, then we're missing something in this this quilt. And we've got this beautiful picture. If you get a minute, come up and look at this picture. This was left by a a former pastor here of a diverse Last Supper, of a representative Last Supper. And it's a little glimpse of what we're talking about. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. And they're triumphant. Where they're holding palm branches. That symbolize that the Lord Jesus is victorious. And he won us that victory on the cross. Yeah. He conquered death on the cross. So how do we get to this point? How do we get to realizing this vision? Because in our world today, we, we, we acknowledge that we are often so divided, that we're so often pit against one another, that this seems sort of unrealistic. It seems sort of unbelievable. And that might be exactly how John felt. So we've got to go back to the book of Acts, chapter 2. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, the first four verses, it says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this, what I just read you, it's the first time in history when the Holy Spirit is available to everyone. Up until this moment, the Holy Spirit usually resided on a prophet or on a king, an anointed one. And when Jesus conquers death on the cross, it provides equal access. That the veil of the temple is ripped open and the Holy Spirit is now available to his people. And isn't it interesting that the first public act of God through the church is to bring a diverse people together? If you were to read more of that passage, all of a sudden, the people that had gathered are able to speak languages that they haven't learned before. And you might say, well, Tom, why is that? Why is this the first act? Well, God, I don't know if you know this, but God's pretty smart. God knows what he's doing. And at Pentecost, all of the Jewish people would have been, from that area, from that region, would have been gathered in Jerusalem. 
and they're different ethnicities. They speak different languages. They're from different parts around the Mediterranean Sea. And, but So they came together. And so the Holy Spirit is unleashed. And they begin to hear about the gospel and what the Spirit is doing. And people's lives are changed. And people's lives are transformed. And then you know what happens? They go home. They go back to their neighborhoods. They go back to their communities. They go back to their families. And they say, let me tell you what the Lord has done. Which, by the way, if you don't know what that word testimony means, that's a testimony. Some people say, well, pastor, I don't have a testimony. And that's not true. Everybody's got a testimony. Because the Lord has done something in your life. The Lord has brought you through something. The Lord has sustained you through something. The Lord has called you to something. And for everybody, the Lord has saved you from something. Hallelujah. So everybody's got a testimony. So they come back from this moment in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And they say, let me tell you what the Lord has done. And the church starts to grow by leaps and bounds because God wants to start realizing this vision of this diverse, global people of God. And so continuing on then in Revelation, back to Revelation 7, continuing on in verse 10, it says, They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, they're united in the truth that Jesus saves, and therefore he alone is worthy of our worship. And let me tell you this morning, that was a pretty subversive message because there was a Caesar who said, I'm in charge, I am the king of kings, I am the lord of lords, I sit here in Rome, ruling over the Roman Empire, and salvation belongs to me. You are protected, you're safe from enemies because of me. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. There's only one king. And his name is Jesus. Yes, sir. And you know what? I, don't, I, I want to make sure we don't get that twisted. You can clap. That's all right. That's all right. There's freedom in this place this morning. Yes. You might say, okay, well, that's, that's obvious. This is Bible times. But I want to say that sometimes we forget this. I don't know if you're aware of this. You probably are, that there's an election coming up next year. And already we've got men and women telling us that the world is going to go to hell unless we vote for them. That we are doomed unless we vote for them on both parties. Yep. Let me tell you this. The only one who saves is Jesus. Yeah. Now, I'm not telling you don't vote. I'm not telling you not to be involved in your... I'm not saying that. But let's just set our expectations right. They might be able to bring some change or some progress, but Jesus is the one that saves. That's right. Jesus is the, ones that bring, is the only one that can bring new life, that can bring real life to us. So he alone is worthy. Let's not be lifting anybody else's name up before we lift up the name of Jesus, okay? Are we all together on this? Amen. Okay, all right. So all the angels then were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Because when we understand who Almighty God is and what he has done, it profoundly affects our posture. Let me say that again. When we understand who Almighty God is and what he has done, it profoundly affects our posture. Yeah. When you know what God has done for you, when you know it, you don't have a, a choice but to respond. You know, when I think about the blessings that I've received, friends in my life, family in my life, who had me in mind specifically, who bless me in one way or the other, I, I respond with gratitude. Thank you so much. for You had me on your heart. You had me on your mind. Thank you, Jesus. Do we do that? Do we respond to what God has done for us with a life of gratitude? Do you respond to the goodness of God? Do people know? Sometimes I think we think we, we deserve it. I'll tell you what, when I was growing up, I'll be honest with you, when I was a teenager, I grew up in the church, I heard this stuff every Sunday, blah, 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 pastor, pastor, pastor. All right. And I said, you know what? Jesus died on the cross because that's his job. 
Yeah, Jesus died for me. That's his job. He's doing his job. No, 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 no. I don't deserve that. And neither do you. Jesus didn't go to the cross because that's his job. Jesus went to the cross because he loves you. Jesus went and paid for death for all times because he wants you to be at his table. He wants you to be in his kingdom. He wants you to be in his fellowship. He wants you to be a part of this global family that he is putting together. He didn't have to do it. But he did. So then they respond in verse 12, Amen. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to be be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This almighty God who knows us, loves us, and pursues us is worthy of all of our devotion and praise. He knows us. He knows our story. He knows our background. He knows where you've been. He knows what you're thinking about right now. He knows what you did last night but he still loves us, and he still pursues us. He doesn't look at the mess sometimes we made of our lives and say, well, that's too much for me. It's never too much for Jesus. It's never too much for Jesus. And so he comes closer because he wants a relationship. He doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. A living, active, vibrant relationship. That means back and forth. That I talk to God, but God talks to me. That's how this thing works. Just like relationships I have with my friends and my wife. We communicate. That doesn't mean I just say to God what I need to get off my chest, and then I say, have a good day, Lord. It means I have to take time and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We need to do that. So three questions for you as we finish our time this morning. So how are you responding? How are you contributing to God's vision of a global, multi-ethnic church? Some of you, your first step is you, you rode a train up here. You traveled. You got out of your comfort zone. You came to a place that is not familiar to you to join into worship. Some of you knew that was happening and you decided to come to church today because I want to be a part of that. Do our churches look like the mosaic, the diverse mosaic kingdom of God, or do they look like the people that we're most comfortable with? It's been said, and it continues to be said, that Sunday morning is the most segregated. Sunday morning at ten o'clock is the most segregated hour in America. And that doesn't mean we got to give up our background. That doesn't mean you got to give up. I mean, we got to we got to figure out a way to bring this together. We're, we haven't been done a good job. This is a good first step. That's good. But we can't just do it once a year. It's a good first step. So how are you contributing? What's God calling you to? How's God calling you out? Yeah. And then what's your reason for worship? Yeah. Some of us. We bow our heads when we worship. Some of us, we raise our hands when I worship. Some of us just let it soak in. But what motivates you? What's your intention? Do you just come because this is just what I do every week? What is your reason to give God glory? And then finally, how do you declare God's goodness? Because we were never meant to keep this to ourselves. We were never meant to keep this in a room for one hour on Sundays. We were meant to share it with the world. So how do you declare it? How do you declare it at the, at the supermarket when you're checking out, when that person in front of you is just taking a little bit too long? My God. How do you declare the goodness of God when you're stuck in rush hour traffic? And it's a green light, but that car is just not moving. How do you declare the goodness of God? Because God's still good even in rush hour. Yeah, he is. God's still good, even when that bill comes that you're not sure how you're going to pay. God's still good. Yes, he is. So how do you declare the goodness of God? And might we not do it alone, but might we do it together? So King Jesus, this morning, we declare your goodness, Lord. We declare and acknowledge that this morning is encouraging, but it is but a first step. It is but a first step to 
realizing this picture of Revelation chapter 7, of every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered around the throne, Lord. So motivate us, challenge us, call us out, Lord, that we might participate in this bigger kingdom that's bigger than the kingdom that we try to build ourselves, that it's the kingdom, God, where you alone get the glory. Help us to respond in worship today and every day. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Would you stand with us? service we've had today and what a fabulous word from Pastor Tom today. Amen. Amen. We have an obligation. The Bible tells us we were created to make his praise glorious and we do have many reasons to worship the Lord. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be with you both now and forever. And so as you go, first of all, go down the hallway and have lunch. <laughs> But as you go, may you be reminded 
that only our Lord Jesus is worthy. So give him praise with all that you have and all that you do, not just on Sunday morning. Wherever the Lord would lead you to go, go in his power and his peace. And we want to take a selfie real quick with all of y'all. lunch. Comparison to our service? No, no, no. Oh. Like what, what, what they use, what uh, app they use. Okay. 